Hello and welcome to our afternoon technical session on decommissioning titled Decommissioning in a Dynamic Environment. My name is Jeremy Groom. I'm the Acting Deputy Director of the Division of Decommissioning, Uranium Recovery and Waste Programs in the NRC's Office of Nuclear Materials Safety and Safeguards. We have a great lineup scheduled for today with a focus on sharing broad perspectives from our panel members on reactor decommissioning topics, including challenges and lessons learned on a wide range of technical and regulatory topics. In addition to hearing about program milestones achieved over the past year and the current status of a variety of decommissioning projects, including the Fukushima Daiichi plant, you will hear from us how the NRC is working with the regulated community to build on past experience to safely and effectively terminate licenses for power reactors undergoing decommissioning. Keeping with this year's RIC theme of navigating the nuclear future, today's presentations will include information on efforts underway to enhance our regulatory framework for plants and decommissioning, as well as how innovation and advancements in technology are being used to accelerate decontamination, dismantling, waste disposal, and site remediation in a safe and effective manner. Before I introduce our panel members, I'd like to cover a couple of quick logistical items. First, the Wi-Fi code for attendees is RIC 2023. As a reminder, please remember to silence your mobile devices. After our panel presentations are over and time permitting, we will enter a question and answer period. For those of you joining virtually, the process for asking a question is the same as the last two RICs through the RIC website. Once you have logged in and joined the session, there will be a tab for electronic Q&A where you can ask your questions. For those of you in the room, you can also join in the Q&A. The QR code, which is on the screen to my left, will re redirect the mobile device user to the specific session page for Q&A. First time users will need to log on to the platform by entering their name and email address that they use to register for the RIC, but you only need to do this once per day. Questions from both the virtual attendees and the in-person attendees will be added to the same queue, and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. It's now my pleasure to introduce our panel members for today's session, including representatives from the NRC, NEI, Energy Solutions, and Japan's NDF. Our NRC panel member today is Anthony Dimitriadis. Anthony serves as the branch chief of the decommissioning, ISFC, and reactor health physics branch in NRC Region 1. He has worked for NRC Region 1 for 30 years and has had extensive experience as a branch chief and as a senior inspector. Representing the Nuclear Energy Institute is Bruce Montgomery, who is the director of decommissioning and used fuel. Bruce has 45 years of commercial nuclear experience with Bechtel Power Corporation, Baltimore Gas and Electric, Constellation Energy, and Exelon. Now at NEI, Bruce is responsible for industry policy on decommissioning matters where he runs the NEI Decommissioning Working Group. Also with us today is Amy Hazelhoff, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Energy Solutions. Amy has more than 24 years of nuclear power experience working in the areas of regulatory affairs, major projects, and design engineering for both a utility and a consulting firm. And rounding out today's panel is Tokyohiro Yamamoto. Mr. Yamamoto is the Executive Director of Japan's Nuclear Damage Compensation and Decommissioning Facilitation Corporation, where he leads the project management of decommissioning work at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. He has more than 40 years of experience in the research and development of the nuclear fuel cycle and spent fuel reprocessing with the Japanese Atomic Energy Agency. I'd also like to acknowledge our session liaison, Bruce Watson, who's at the table to my, to my right. Bruce has been a integral part of the NRC's decommissioning oversight program since 2004, 
having served as the reactor decommissioning branch chief for 12 years, over 12 years. His previous experience includes management of defense complex decommissioning projects at Rocky Flats. Bruce also has 20 years of operating reactor experience and served as a radiation safety manager at Calvert Cliffs. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Christian Dennis, a health physicist in our reactor decommissioning branch since 2020, and who has served as the session coordinator for today. There is a tremendous amount of work that goes into planning a RIC session, and today's session would not be possible without Christian's hard work and dedication, so thank you. I'd like to end my opening remarks by just uh, displaying the contact information for today's panel. Um, with that, uh, that concludes my opening remarks. Thank you for your time and attention, and I'll turn the uh, presentation and the floor over to Anthony, who's going to talk to you about the NRC's decommissioning inspection program. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope to, uh, I have about eight slides to go over with you that focus on decommissioning inspections and uh, our insights based on those inspections. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to touch a little bit on insights based on our inspections at six different sites in Region 1 and nine plants uh, within Region 1. Some obviously are uh, multi-unit sites. Uh, I'll briefly cover the, the transition that uh, plant, a plant goes through when it shuts down for the final time and enters into either safe store or active decommissioning mode. I'll also uh, go over some challenges as well as some uh, successes. Finally, I'll cover some findings or violations that were identified. Next slide, please. Uh, reactor sites operate for years before their operators decide to permanently shut them down. Uh, during operation, the NRC uses what's called the reactor oversight process, uh, the, the reactor oversight program, otherwise known as the ROP, that is outlined in the inspection manual chapter 0305. When a site permanently shuts down and the fuel is removed uh, from the reactor vessel for the final time, the licensee submits a notification to the NRC uh, in accordance with uh, 10 CFR 50.82. Upon receipt of such notification, the NRC staff shifts its oversight and ceases using the reactor oversight process that I mentioned uh, and begins using the decommissioning power reactor inspection program. This program is described in our inspection manual chapter 2561. Uh, this, uh, this chapter is, it, it really isn't long, it's about 15 pages describing our process of inspections, planning, communications, even lists the, the inspection procedures that we actually use. Uh, the reason I bring it up is because as we transition oversight from the ROP for, uh, to the decommissioning uh, power reactor inspection program, our um, process utilizes what's called the traditional enforcement process uh, uh, program and not uh, the reactor oversight program we issue violations as opposed to colored findings that you may have heard for operating reactors like green, white, yellow, and red. Next slide, please. The decommissioning inspection program has been in place since uh, the early to mid-1990s. In 2021, uh, the staff revised uh, the program and it issued uh, a revision to the IMC 2561 that describes the inspection program for reactor facilities. As you can see in the slide, along with the inspection manual chapter, the staff also revised a number of the inspection procedures, including for one IP 71801, that's entitled decommissioning performance and status reviews at permanently shut down reactors. This is one of our core nine, nine core procedures that we use to evaluate the status of decommissioning, to evaluate the licensee's decommissioning staffing, qualifications, and conduct of decommissioning. It's one of nine procedures, core procedures. There are other procedures that we have. There's like 20 or 25 other that are general procedures that we can draw upon, but these are our core procedures that we utilize. Uh, we also plucked out certain portions of uh, IP 37801, which pertains to the review process for changes, tests, uh, and experiments in accordance with 5059. It also focuses on a programmatic uh, aspect of the program, looks at the PINR aspect, adds samples, and removed some references to what we used to call SALP, the Systematic Assessment of Licensee Performance, a uh, program that was used back in the 90s prior, as was used in the, uh, uh, prior to the establishment of the ROP. So we took that out and updated it. Uh, we relocated fire protection inspections under IP 64704, 
which is a new procedure. And finally, we address recommendations made by a working group called the Reactor Decommissioning Financial Assurance Working Group. Uh, we focus certain aspects of financial assurance on that. For example, the staff added certain focus points and potential triggers that could, uh, that could actually potentially trigger initiation of NRC decommissioning reactor financial assurance spot checks uh, that would be supported by the financial assurance branch in NMSS. Uh, next slide, please. We are seeing that uh, sites are effectively planning their decommissioning work and working their plans. Uh, as you can imagine, there are a million different details involved in deconstructing a reactor and ensuring that it is done safely. Uh, sites are doing this effectively and as a result of external forces involved with supplies, transportation, labor, uh, they make numerous, actually thousands of adjustments. Uh, this has an effect on schedules, but it's impressive how such adjustments have not affected the long-term schedule in a significant manner. Uh, cultures. That's another thing we're seeing. Uh, we're seeing a vast difference in cultures from site to site. Uh, all sites retained a portion of the plant employees which has served them well due to their familiarity uh, from when the plant was operating. Uh, the sites have also had to supplement the on-site staffing with employees from local communities like union halls and such. Uh, this has resulted in a number of employees that did not emerge from a nuclear background and therefore have not been previously indoctrinated in the very low threshold safety culture that comes from working at a nuclear site. Therefore, we're seeing some differences from site to site where folks who, uh, who were not uh, raised in nuclear business uh, were not placing conditions in, in the licensees corrective action program. This is something that had to be adjusted by the site managers to ensure that it was done correctly. And lastly, the, the CAP, the corrective action program. Uh, the, the variety of cultures has also resulted in how each site has adopted or embraced the corrective action program. Uh, as you know, the NRC expects its licensees to identify and correct problems, and use of the corrective action program is essential. Uh, overall, the li our licensees have effectively used the, uh, the CAP, uh, the corrective action program, uh, and continued adherence and vigilance is really a key to future success. Next slide, please. So we've seen some challenges. Uh, some of the challenges that we are seeing involve fires due to what is called the hot work on site. Uh, there have been a few fires in the course of cutting and welding uh, in deconstructing the site, as you would imagine. Uh, this is something that licensees should be particularly careful with and share the operational experience with other decommissioning sites. And they actually do that uh, fairly well, but uh, we want to get the word out. Um, Next, uh, lack of surveys. We are seeing that occasionally sites are not performing um, uh, surveys where the site staff uh, sometimes attempt to make decisions about relevant information on actual conditions on the ground. Uh, surveys are the key to success at a decommissioning site in trying to figure out how to take things apart and safely. Obviously, there's contamination. The first thing on, on, on order is really the uh, doing surveys. Uh, certain security issues f have also emerged, which sometimes result in NRC violations, which we'll get into in a future slide. We're also seeing some aspects of the non-nuclear culture uh, resulting in a lack of sensitivity from working at a nuclear facility. I, 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 sa I stated that er previously. Let me just say a few words on this. Uh, when working at a nuclear facility that is licensed by the NRC, it is imperative that uh, each on-site employee be very sensitive to the protocols associated with identifying and capturing conditions. Uh, this means entering the condition into the corrective action program that will allow the overall organization to become aware of the condition and to address it accordingly. We have seen and interviewed uh, with numerous uh, folks that were not previously attuned to this. Uh, Lyce managers, as well as our staff, uh, have tirelessly uh, taken the time to interact and answer questions and comments from on-site staff. Last but not least, we have uh, come to appreciate that our stakeholders, on-site staff, members of the public, local elected officials, state officials, and members of the United States Congress uh, do not necessarily understand what decommissioning is uh, and what it involves. Furthermore, it has become evident that our stakeholders sometimes do not have a full understanding or appreciation of the risks associated with the work being done at a decommissioning reactor site. 
We have worked hard to explain some of the work and have addressed issues such as financial assurance, transportation of radioactive waste, uh, storage of spent fuel, and especially effluent discharges as permitted under our regulations. One of the major challenges has been staffing, staffing for the NRC. Uh, we are hiring, by the way. Uh, I'm hiring, <laughs> we've, been, we've been short, I know the industry is too. Um, staffing for licensees at decommissioning sites and in spent fuel management. This has been a significant challenge all around since we all came upon what I call COVID pond, and it continues. Next slide, please. As this slide shows, we have seen violations involving um, uh, surveys, um, I'm sorry, uh, security, a failure to detect and assess potential intruders under Part 73, uh, failure to detect and immediately assess unauthorized personnel in a zone uh, containing what we call Category 1 and Category 2 under uh, 10 CFR Part 37 security. Uh, we've also seen um, a number of violations involving radway shipping that contain the wrong shipping and paper information. Uh, for example, shipping of a package, let's say F, had shipping papers that described information meant for package B, not F, therefore wrong information. Uh, so that would be a violation. And lastly, fires. As I mentioned earlier, we've seen a number of violations involving fires due to A, uh, the fire watch person left their station too early or were not present when the hot work was still active, or B, failure to remove combustible material from the area of the active hot work, or C, failure to follow procedures and not remove certain equipment that could cause a fire in violation of site procedures. Next slide, please. Now I'll go over some successes. NRC staff have done a remarkable job in communicating internally, supporting inspections across regions. For example, uh, some of my folks have gone from Region 1 to Region 4 to support inspections, and we've actually gotten uh, reciprocal uh, help from Region 4. And program offices, we ensure that our efforts and are objective and consistent. This is really important to us. We don't want to be easy on one licensee and tougher on another licensee based on performance. Our job is to be consistent in our regulatory approach. Our staff has also attended or held public meetings to discuss decommissioning, spent fuel management, decommissioning inspections, and effluent discharges which result uh, from the process of de decommissioning, and we will continue to do so. Uh, this has been a challenging uh, challenge for us due to the staffing issues as well as the onset of COVID. Uh, but our staff has done a great job to ensure that the NRC mission was met. Uh, sites have made significant progress, so this is a success for the sites uh, in dismantling and deconstructing their respective sites. Uh, there have been significant challenges beginning, beginning with the onset of COVID, as I mentioned, supply chain shortages, weather delays, changes in staffing due to people retiring, that's one of the major factors here, uh, and getting fatigued due to the uh, added stress of COVID, and a shortage of radiation protection personnel to support certain activities. Lastly, the sites have shipped a lot of low-level radioactive waste to various radioactive waste sites. This involves use of trains and trucks with appropriate labeling, marking, communications, and the use of proper shipping papers. This is detailed work that must be done properly uh, and has been done successfully hundreds or thousands of times that you may not even see on the news, which is the success here. This may not be known, but it does not cease to be a success for the folks doing the, this important work. This concludes my presentation. Bruce? Yeah, thank you, Tony. Clicker. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here at the RIC. I think this is my fourth RIC uh, in my capacity as a decommissioning guy at NEI. It's always a pleasure to be here, and it's great to be here in person again. Opportunity to share industry's high-level perspectives on, on how things are going in decommissioning. And Tony, thank you for those comments. I think what my takeaway is that uh, things are going okay, uh, but there's an opportunity for some learning in some of these issues, and uh, we take those to heart and take those seriously. I especially like your comment on the variety of safety cultures. Um, there's gonna be a tension between the folks that are used to running the plant uh, to very strict nuclear procedures and um, uh, human behavior uh, traits. And those guys that come in that are used to deconstruction practices, which really tend to be in conflict with uh, some of the cultures that we've become used to. So it's important that we learn 
how to make sure that those two cultures mesh properly in a safe and effective way and uh, uh, as we demonstrate um, our success. I think my observation over the past year is that, uh, you know, for the most part, we're proceeding through decommissioning in a fairly orderly fashion. We're learning as we go. Uh, improvements in the application of technology and our experience in project management. And we are getting better and better at the nuts and bolts of uh, how to decommission a reactor. Now, I say for the most part. While the typical timeline from reactor shutdown to completion of all the physical decommissioning work appears to be getting shorter, the overall project timeline to the ultimate objective, license termination, does not appear to be shrinking at all. In fact, uh, it appears that it might be expanding and is at the risk of, of or it is expanding uh, due to problems we are encountering at the back end of the process. Over the past two years, I've been working with a small team of industry subject matter experts to better understand the license termination process and to suggest improvements that will establish a greater degree of stability and efficiency in the license termination process. So that's the topic of my remarks today in the focus. It's really been my day job for the past two years. Termination, complete, on schedule, and within budget. So how can we achieve that? Well, maybe not the way that guy does, but what we're really looking for here is how can a decommissioning licensee craft and submit a license termination plan, or LTP, to the NRC, have it approved in about a year, implement it, and be able to achieve unrestricted release of the site back to the public within the eight-year overall time frame that we expect to, to consistently see in the future. So why is this important? As I said in my remarks over the past two or three RICs, my personal driver, which I believe is broadly shared by the decommissioning community, is not just to show that we can get this right, but to show that we can get this right to illustrate commercial nuclear power as a sustainable enterprise. I've spoken in the past about how decommissioning is just part of the circle of life for nuclear. Design, build, operate, decommission, repeat. We have to be good at all phases to be credible in a world that is focused on sustainable resources and practices. With decommissioning practices or projects in particular, there are two choices that we've been making recently over the past few years in decommissioning that illustrate the trend towards sustainability. First, where we have the choice between putting a plant in safe store for 60 years or pursuing decon, we've been choosing decon. The term you will hear in the community is accelerated decon. Second, where we have a choice between restricted release of a site where controls must be left in place to protect the public and the environment, we choose unrestricted release. From a sustainability perspective, these choices make a lot of sense. There is great opportunity here. It's not just about getting these projects across the finish line. It's about getting these projects across the finishing line with schedules that make sense to communities and the future investors, with projects that are performed with fiscal discipline and predictability, and by companies that demonstrate strong environmental stewardship. The result will be a business enterprise that has earned the public trust. The result isn't a foregone conclusion. We face challenges, and I'll name a few. The decommissioning workforce is limited, limited in a few key areas. And I really like Commissioner Wright's comments in response to a question yesterday about what workers we're short of, health physicists. That's certainly true for the back end of decommissioning, where license termination work requires a great deal of high and RP and health physics expertise. On top of that, we have a large workload with 12 reactors uh, in active decommissioning at the present time. Those projects either have LTPs in some stage of NRC review or are thinking of submitting one in the next several years. And the process of writing an LTP can be daunting. The experience we have from plants like Connecticut Yankee, Rancho Seco, and Trojan is dated and difficult to recreate. The regulatory guidance is voluminous and hard to assimilate, particularly for newcomers to decommissioning. 
Much of that guidance was written broadly to encompass all different types of facilities res regulated not just by the NRC, but also overseen by the EPA, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Defense. Lots of different circumstances and situations are covered, a good bit of which might not apply to commercial nuclear reactors. And even with all the guidance there is out there, there's a few technical gaps emerging during the reviews of the current uh, decommissioning projects that need to be closed if we are to be efficient. And the final challenge that I would highlight owes to the fundamental nature of the decommissioning industry in the United States. It's competitive. And the fundamental behavior of a competitive industry is not always conducive to open sharing and collaboration. So these challenges all beg for solutions. Without solutions in LTP space, we'll be, we will be at risk of a world where physical decommissioning work is complete at these sites, but the radiological surveys and the regulatory reviews to demonstrate that the work was done in accordance with the regulations and the LTP can take years, in fact, many years, after the last piece of heavy equipment has left the site. So that's the tough news. Uh, and like Tony, I'd like to focus a little bit on, on the progress that we've been making and reward ourselves the progress that we have made, some of which is quite recent. First, as I mentioned, innovation and advancements in technology are accelerating the process of decontamination, dismantling, waste packaging and transportation, and disposal. Uh, the timelines for sh between shutdown and getting all the fuel into dry storage is shrinking rapidly as we've seen demonstrated at, at recent sites. We need to bring some of that high-tech technology over to the back end where radiological surveys and analysis could benefit from some of those advancements as well. And I'm confident that we will. Second, the NRC has published a proposed rule that promises to rationalize the regulatory transition from operating status to decommissioning that will eliminate the need for many license amendments and exemptions. We hope to see a final rule on that in 2024. Third, we are starting to see competitors collaborating on projects that will improve business for everyone. Improving the license termination process is a great example of this. In addition, the NRC has recognized the value of engaging with the industry in a discussion of lessons learned to improve performance. And we are supporting NRC's plan to conduct a public workshop on decommissioning lessons learned in a couple of months. I've already mentioned this issue, so I won't dwell on it other to, than to say that it, our immediate focus is to give the playbook for license termination a tune-up. This is a complicated process, so it's very important that the guidance to licensees and to NRC <coughs> reviewers is applicable, clear, and concise. And that's not, never so easy to do, but in, in 2020, at NEI, we set off to do just that, and more on that in just a minute. So it's important to recognize the dynamic nature of decommissioning, hence the title of this panel. The regulatory oversight uh, of decommissioning, the project itself, it, are closely intertwined on top of each other along with the process for planning and executing a license termination uh, uh, plan. It's, it's overlaid in a way that just creates nightmares for project managers uh, in the industry and NRC alike. Let me illustrate. LTPs contain the exceptions criteria for the work to be performed. The regulations state that LTPs must be submitted to the NRC for review and approval no later than two years in advance of the request to terminate a license. NRC's approval of the LTP governs much of the work conducted throughout the course of the project, and if the, F if the LTP is not submitted much earlier than two years before the need, then by then and by the time of the approval, most of all the major work and D&D has already been done, which means much of that work was done at risk. So what could possibly go wrong here? So being a good nuclear engineer that we are, we think we can figure this out. So the punchline here is that, and I'm happy to announce, that on Valentine's Day, the industry submitted NEI 2201, license termination process to the NRC for review. It's a comprehensive guide that consolidates regulatory guidance in one place. It makes it specific to commercial reactors. It emphasizes the value of very early planning. 
It includes operating experience to direct users to what works and what doesn't. It outlines the importance of early and frequent regulatory engagement, and it serves as a vehicle to capture future learnings. Our hope is to achieve NRC endorsement and ultimately alignment around what a quality LTP looks like and how it should be implemented in the field. So in closing, we recognize that sharing lessons learned is not the natural trait of a competitive marketplace, but collectively we are working together where it makes sense. And I'll leave you with a picture of how we organize around decommissioning at NEI. We get a lot of help from our membership. And along those lines, I would like to extend my special thanks and appreciation to Jerry Van Dordenen and Sarah Roberts of Energy Solutions, Gene Fleming of Holtec, Rich McGrath of EPRI, Eric DeRoyce of RSCS, Bill Barley of Pacific Gas and Electric, and Ron Cartarelli and Wayne Harris of CN Associates. Also, our own Mike Smith at NEI for their many hours of writing and debate over countless meetings and phone calls over the past two years. But you're not off the hook yet. I'm looking forward to a, a healthy exchange with the NRC on this document to, to uh, improve the quality of everything we're doing and the, the level of information in that document. So thank you, and now I'll turn the discussion over to Amy. Thank you, that's a great one. Greetings. Thank you, Bruce. It's a pleasure to be on this esteemed panel today and speak with you all this afternoon. So Energy Solutions has projects at various stages of completion. I will note that we are the licensee at La Crosse, Zion, Three Mile Island Unit 2, and Kiwani. And we are key partners at Savannah, Fort Calhoun, and Songs. As you can imagine, we have kept the NRC very busy, both headquarters and region. And on behalf of Energy Solutions, I do want to extend a thank you to the NRC for their commitment to ensuring that the health and safety of the public remains at the forefront of these important decommissioning projects. I'm very pleased to share that La Crosse received the safety evaluation and license termination from the NRC in late February. The license transfer back to Dairyland is pending, so that's very exciting and a huge milestone for the industry. My focus today is on the licensee perspective on two specific topics. The first is planning and scheduling regulatory activities, and the second is on leveraging technology for safety and efficiency. Okay. So prepare a regulatory schedule that includes all licensing and compliance activities and integrate that schedule into the site master schedule. Success is measured by field activities not being delayed by pending permit approval or regulatory approvals. So Bruce spoke about LTP license termination plan Focus on development early. These have historically taken two to three years from initial submittal to NRC approval. And as Bruce noted, any delay in LTP approval results in work being done at risk. Additional regulatory considerations. To obtain unrestricted future use of the site by the state, the site must meet the EPA soil and groundwater activity limits for specific radionuclides. The LTP replaces the groundwater monitoring program once approved and implemented. So this is a high level decommissioning timeline. It shows key activities and milestones. This is consistent with NEI 2201, Bruce can attest. I do just want to highlight, if I can, yeah, here we go. So right in the center there, LTP development and FSS procedure development start early and do run in series. It's very important to coordinate NRC inspections. 
But coordination with both NRC and state inspectors is key, and communicating any schedule changes promptly is also key. Surveys of excavations must be coordinated with both NRC headquarters and region staff, as these are done before the FSS is complete and therefore at risk. Okay. Now I'm gonna to shift to Three Mile Island. Our focus at Three Mile Island is on leveraging technology for safety and efficiency. TMI2 Solutions recognizes its responsibility to ensure that the unique historic record of the TMI2 de decommissioning project is sufficiently captured. The TMI2 facility was deemed eligible for the National Register of Historic Places in 2010 by the Pennsylvania State Historic Preservation Organization, also known as SHPO. As you can imagine, there is a significant amount of historic interest in TMI2 between the state and various museums. One area of high interest is the pres preservation of the TMI2 control room panels. Okay. So at Energy Solutions, we manage remote field work and use new technologies to drive low dose performance. This includes a variety of applications robotics and drones, scanning and modeling, remote monitoring, and I'll get into some of these here in the next few slides. So robotics and drones. Energy Solutions utilizes both robotics and drones at TMI2. Recently, drones have taken video and radiation surveys of the entire reactor building, which is allowing us to see areas that have not been seen since 1979. So very effective use of technology there. Robots are also being used to enter high radiation zones. And in a few slides, you will get to meet this robot, who we affectionately call SPOT. OK, scanning and modeling. Used effectively for radiation heat mapping to show hot spots. And we do use this as a guide for future dose reduction. This picture shows the TMI2 reactor building air coolers that were heavily contaminated during the accident and are a high dose source in the 305, which is the ground floor elevation of the reactor building. Okay, remote operation and monitoring. We remotely monitor radiation, radiation dose and field work from a command center this allows two-way communication from workers in the field to stakeholders in the office. Another tool to reduce worker radiation and industrial safety exposure. Additional applications, I won't get into all of these, but again, all things that we're using to reduce risk and dose. All right, I promise spot in action. So these two photos show Spot removing debris to gain access to the D-rings. There was a wooden frame around the D-ring opening with a screen attached to it, which was dislodged during the accident. So here you see Spot tugging at the debris to move it out of the way to gain access. This showcases Spot again with his um, arm manipulation. It, 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 this is a large range, obviously, and can pick up a, you know, a certain weight of various debris. This also shows the same. So these are pi this picture here, this is the infamous block wall. It's the source of the highest radiation levels in the basement. These photos show Spot taking radiation surveys in the reactor building basement. And here he has the boom extended, so rad protection attached dosimetry to Spot at the three, six, and eight foot levels to get a dose profile. I'm very happy to report that Spot performed exceptionally well. He took over 1,200 rem cumulative with no impact to battery life camera or motion. 
So in closing, I just want to note that TMI2 does have a citizens advisory panel, also known as the CAP. It was established in April of 2021 to engage the local community. We have held six virtual meetings, and those presentations are available at tmi2solutions.com. I can tell you from experience that we have a very dedicated team at TMI2 between all of our employees and key partners doing unprecedented work. I do want to specifically recognize the TMI2 regulatory staff who've been working tirelessly, as you can imagine. So Tim, Hannah, and Jim, I know you're all here somewhere. Thank you for your efforts. So I will now introduce Mr. Yamamoto. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, uh, OK, uh, I would like to introduce you uh, the outline of the status and plans of the decommissioning of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant that experienced severe accident 12 years ago. And before starting my presentation, I would like to note that many OHPs I am showing you today are quoted from various sources. And also, please note that I will refer to Fukushima Daiichi as 1F for short. Next, please. Uh, this one shows the contents of my uh, speech, and after the short introduction, I will move on to the technical issue of the decommissioning. Next, please. And it shows the organizational structure. After the accident, there was a need for injecting funds to TEPCO, which is the owner and operator of 1F, to cover the compensations for the loss and damage caused, caused from nuclear accidents. And Japan first injected public funds in 2011 for this compensation. Later in 2014, the government decided to add a scheme to facilitate the decomm decommissioning and dismantling the damaged power plants. For that purpose, the NDF was established by a special act. The NDF provides uh, financial assistance and longer-term technical management of TEPCO's decommissioning program. To establish such a long-term management using public funds, the NDF collaborates very closely with TEPCO and, gov and the government. Next, please. Next, please. Okay. And the uh, three parties coordinate the uh, progress and plans through the uh, documents publicly available. The government publishes a mid- and long-term roadmap. The MDF publishes a, a, a technical uh, strategic plan. In the roadmap, our status is in the uh, phase two presently. The removal of fuel assemblies from the pool is underway, and uh, many achievements are realized for, for the management of radioactive waste and water. There is a delay for about two years in the action of fast retrieval of fuel debris. Next, please. And uh, from now, uh, I'd like to explain the uh, technical issue of the mm -hmm. one of the commission. And at first, uh, let me quick review of the accident. That, that accident, the reactor core melting unit one, two, three, and hydrogen was generated because of the oxidation of fuel cladding it led to hydrogen explosion in unit one, three, and four. And after the accident, fuel assemblies in the reactor buildings were uh, removed from unit three and four, and fuel assemblies are still stored and cooled in unit one and two. Next, please. And one of the biggest issues of 1F decommissioning is contaminated water management. Contaminated water is generated daily, mainly because the groundwater seeps into the building and is mixed with highly contaminated water. And uh, countermeasures for contaminated water have been carried out based on three principles. First one is removing contamination from uh, water, shown in red one. The second one is removing, redirecting groundwater from con contamination sources shown in blue one. And the third one is uh, preventing leakage, shown in green one. 
And lower charge shows the uh, reduction of the generation rate of contaminated water is achieved from about 500 cubic meters per day in 2014 or 2015 to about 130 cubic meters per day in 2021. The contaminated water is collected and uh, treated in a safe way. The mulch nuclide removal system, ARPS, removes most, uh, removes most radionuclides uh, from the contaminated water, except for tritium. Next, please. Also, uh, water containing tritium has been stored in tanks since the accident. The water needs to be handled in a way as other uh, nuclear facilities do to release the land from being used for tank storage. The safe and reliable solution is to discharge into the sea after dilution. The uh, treated water discharge system shown here will become available uh, this uh, later spring to summer. And in order to implement the uh, treated water discharge into sea, it is necessary to continue to provide uh, accurate information and uh, open and transparent monitoring of all systems and uh, discharges is required and also continuous ocean monitoring will be essential. Next, please. And the next item is uh, fuel uh, removal from spent fuel pools of Unit 1 and 2. About Unit 1, uh, a large cover will be installed to achieve further reduction of radioactive dust dispersion risk. And after the removal of the rubble, including the displaced overhead crane shown in green in the uh, left picture. And removal of fuel is expected to begin in 2017 to 2018. And after unit two shown in light, uh, making opening on the south side of the uh, reactor building, fuel will be removed from this opening using a bottom type, uh, boom type, crane system operated remotely. The construction work has already started and removal of fuel uh, is expected to begin in 2024 to 2026. Next, please. And the next item is fuel debris retrieval. This slide shows uh, how much we know about the distribution of fuel debris. And let me give a, a very brief uh, introduction. And uh, about uh, uh, unit one, most of the fuel debris is present at the PCB bottom inside the pedestal. And about unit two, large amount of fuel debris is present at the reactor pressure vessel lower head. And uh, about three, the distribution of fuel debris in, in, in unit three is about halfway between unit one and two. And some amount of fuel debris may have spread outside the pedestal in unit one and three. Like this, the situation inside the PCB is gradually becoming clear, but still now information is limited. And we do not have visual data inside the reactor pressure vessel up to now. Next, please. This figure shows the system for uh, trial retrieval fuel debris uh, in unit two. The uh, operation will be performed by opening hatch of penetration and the robot arm moved in and out to retrieve fuel debris inside the PCB. And to achieve that, a new containment barrier uh, should be provided outside the PCB. These robot arm and containment barrier system are now under the test and adjustment, and, there, and the trial retrieval is expected to start in late 2023 fiscal year. Next one, please. And after the trial fuel retrieval and subsequent uh, gradual expansion of the retrieval scale, Further expansion or large scale of fuel debris retrieval is expected. This OHP shows the 
typical FUELWS retrieval method which have been studied. Dry method uh, and new submersion method shown in left and center are now mainly being discussed and both methods have no proven track record in the nuclear industry. And many challenging issues and risks have been identified. And the NDF has recently decided to start discussion about the method of large-scale fuel debris retrieval at the newly established subcommittee to contribute to determine the debris uh, retrieval method. Next one, please. Uh, next item is about the analysis. Uh, the characterization of fuel debris and waste is quite important for uh, promptness and rationality of decommissioning. And the analysis of such fuel debris and waste will be is a critical and essential path. In this context, existing hot laboratories operated by uh, nuclear fuel fabricators and JAEA are being utilized, shown in green one. And uh, to reinforce the analytical capacity and functions, three uh, hot laboratories in the 1F site are planned. The first one is for uh, solid waste and uh, treated water analysis, uh, showing blue left, and uh, is in service since last uh, autumn. And second one is for fuel debris analysis and is now under licensing procedure light one or blue. And the last one is under uh, the design by TEPCO for future needs of analysis, shown in pink. And like this, the uh, facilities for analysis are being developed in stages to meet analytical needs. Next one, please. Uh, the fundamental principle for decommissioning is be balancing between reconstruction and decommissioning. And it is important to uh, deepen the understanding of local residents about the decommissioning through uh, interactive uh, communication. In addition, the continuous uh, cooperation of companies is essential and especially revitalizing decommissioning related industries is an important pillar of TEPCO's contribution to the reconstruction of Fukushima Prefecture. Based on these understandings, NDF have many activities on dialogues with stakeholders, including holding the international forum, hearing activity with local communities and others. Next one, please. Uh, last one is about the international cooperation. The decommissioning of the 1F is expected to be a long-term project with many challenging engineering issues. To solve these issues, it is important to learn lessons from precedent overseas case and to utilize the world's highest level of technology and human resources. At the same time, we recognize th that as the PCV's internal situation is gradually becoming clear, it's becoming more and more important to share the decommissioning experience, including information not only on the progress of the decommissioning, but also findings and knowledge gained through the decommissioning activities. Next one, please. It shows the uh, reference, uh, and as my closing words, let me invite you to the International Forum of 1F Decommissioning, which is scheduled on August 27 and 28 for this year. I'm looking forward to your participation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry about the mic. Well, thank you, Mr. Yamamoto, Amy, Bruce, and uh, Anthony. That, that was a great presentation, very interesting. Um, I do want to apologize for the technical difficulties during Mr. Yamamoto's presentation. <laughs> um, I would just remind uh, those of you online and in the audience, um, his slides are available, will be available on the RIC website. Um, it covers the information that maybe wasn't captured during the, the microphone difficulties that we had. And I would also encourage you to look at the references. There's links in each of his references that have just a wealth of information about the status of Fukushima and where uh, Japan is with that decommissioning, very complex decommissioning project. So thank you again to our panel members.
Um, I'm now going to get into the Q&A, and we had several uh, great questions that came in uh, while the panelists were pre presenting. And um, I'll just start with, uh, actually, Bruce, I have one for you. Um, so let me just pull it up real quick. So, you know, we're all interested in knowledge management, experience, how we address, uh, you know, an aging workforce and being ready for the future. This very much goes with the, the theme of this year's, Rick, of navigating the nuclear future. You spoke about meshing of experience, and um, the, the, the question is, what, what advice can you give to longtime nuclear workers on kind of that transition from operating standards to decommissioning standards? How do you maintain the appropriate levels of rigor throughout the decommissioning process? Uh, any insights? And Amy, maybe if you have any insights on that as well, we'd be interested. Bruce? Well, I think the best advice that we can give to folks um, that are coming out of the operating fleet and are now working on decommissioning projects is to, is to have an open mind. Uh, you want to maintain that discipline and procedure compliance. Um, but, um, you know, one of the stories I always like to hear from uh, one of my colleagues at Energy Solutions is you walk down the hallway uh, in the reactor building and, or in the turbine building and you see um, the de a decommissioning group working and the plant's been long shut down, the fuel's out of the core, it's in dry storage, and they're carefully unbolting uh, a piece of equipment off the deck. And uh, the supervisor stops and says, why are you doing that? We've got a, a bulldozer that we just bring in here and rip it out of the road and, and, and send it off for scrap. I mean, it's a different culture, uh, but I think, um, you know, for the, the most important thing we can do is encourage the folks at these plants that have operated it for 20, 30, 40, even 50 years to stick around through the decommissioning project. And thankfully, there's great opportunities to do that and learn how decommissioning is done. There will be future opportunities that you've been hearing for the past few days as the new reactors come along. And hopefully, it's at the site you're working on right now uh, to decommission the, the, uh, uh, the reactor that you were working on. So I think uh, stick around, uh, learn how decommissioning is done. You know, we mentioned the 12 reactors that are current through going through active decommissioning right now. Our objective here is to learn as much as we can from those 12 reactors, uh, capture all that information in NEI 2201 and the regulatory framework, put it on the shelf because there's going to be a hiatus. After these plants are done, we won't see, I think, and hopefully, much more in the way of decommissioning. As you know, you've heard, folks are going through SLR. Most of the plants are expected to request subsequent license for renewal, and they'll be operating for quite some time. We don't want to forget what we're about to learn over the next five to 10 years. We want to bottle it and put it on the shelf so that when these folks need it, it's all there. So, um, uh, but I think the real challenges we have right now in, 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 uh, in our workforce is really the high-end health physics expertise on how you set up a survey, how you collect samples, how you maintain QA, QC, how you do the analysis, and how you prepare reports to the NRC for review so you're sending them just the right amount of information and not 40,000 pages of data. Uh, so a um, lot to be learned there. We have workforce planning uh, group uh, that's running it, it, uh, at NEI. Uh, we are seeing the same challenges in decommissioning as the operating fleet is. Uh, and there's a, there's a significant effort uh, under the Nuclear uh, Strategic Advisory uh, Committee to, to figure out how to uh, uh, bring in the new nuclear workers that we so badly need. So hopefully that answers the question. That's great. Thank you, Bruce. Amy, any perspectives you Yeah, I was share? just going to add, um, it's, it's really important that you maintain and keep up with your procedures and processes. Um, I think we can get a little lax with some of the scope that we do in, in decommissioning. And I think, you know, I think, Anthony, you mentioned that we tend to have less experienced staff sometimes in nuclear. So making sure we have those robust procedures and processes and that they're followed, I think, is also key. Great. Thank you. So another question we received, and I'll, I'll take a, a quick stab at this one. Um, how has the Inflation Reduction Act affected the decommissioning outlook for the NRC? It does mention a couple of plants, and I'll, I won't get into specifics, but um, it's a great question, and it's, it's obviously a challenging one for us. Um, I think the bottom line answer is once we receive notification that a plant has permanently ceased operations, plans to transition to decommissioning, we do make plans for that and, and try to budget 
get the workforce ready and, and make the appropriate you know, logistics so that we can you know, address all the different elements of decommissioning. But it's, you know, and it's no secret there are plants that are looking at possibly restarting, possibly extending their lifetime even though they've expressed a, a desire to restart. Many times we work those in parallel. Um, we we want to be ready for any eventuality. And so, you know, when, when a, a utility is kind of going down multiple paths, I think our agency tries to be agile and nimble to make sure that we're ready for both paths. And so the, the plants that are out there now that are, that are kind of exploring these options, you know, our partner agency, NRR, is, is making preparations for, for the other side of it that, that could happen. And so, um, you know, the direct answer to the question, it doesn't really change what we do on a decomm decommissioning side. We want to be ready for that. We try to plan and prepare. But as a big agency with, with partners in the operating side, we also try to make preparations for, for if that plant were to stay in line or restart. So. Uh, Tony, I think this is a, a great question for you. It, it really does go along with your presentation. And um, I think you addressed it a little bit, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about the process that we use. And can you talk a little bit about what the NRC does and what measures we have in place when a regulatory violation is identified at a decommissioning or decommissioning facility? Sure. How do we handle that? Uh, good question. Thank you. So in, uh, when uh, I mentioned in my slides that when a, uh, a site transitions from an operating reactor to a decommissioning reactor, we change from the ROP to the decommissioning power inspection program. The difference there is that we don't utilize the reactor oversight process that uh, is, is a, uh, it's a mature process, but it has more checks and balances. We have the traditional enforcement process. So when one of my inspectors, for example, identifies an issue of concern and it could be a violation, there's a couple of things that go along with that. And the first thing is we first determine is it truly a violation of NRC requirements, orders, uh, licensee commitments, tie downs, things like that. And the next question is, is it greater than minor significance? So we have to clear that hurdle uh, first. And we ha there's a lot of information that goes into that to make that determination. Uh, and we try to do that in an, obse uh, in an objective and consistent manner. And we talk to the, the, uh, the inspectors, uh, of course the inspector who identifies it, but also other inspectors who have experience in the field to make sure that we are objective and consistent. And after that, we use the, tr the uh, traditional enforcement process, the enforcement policy, and the enforcement manual to make sure that we assess it with significance. And the significance levels go from one as the most severe to severity level four or five if it's minor. Uh, so that's our process. And there's a lot of give and take uh, to try to, to see if it lands in the right severity level column. And how do we do that? Well. Um, it's called uh, good judgment. How do you get good judgment? Well, you get it from a lot of bad judgment, right? So we do a lot of hypotheticals, and you want to make sure that you compare licensee A with this condition with another licensee B with a slightly a different variety of, let's say, you change the duration of time for which the violation uh, was in, in, in effect. Uh, to make sure that you're in a good place as far as uh, what we issued in the past, and if it really makes sense, really, you know, effectively makes sense. So that's how, how we do that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tony. I'll, I'll just add a, a couple of things. I do uh, work in the enforcement world. Um, the, the level of rigor that the NRC applies as violations become more significant also increases. So we want to make sure we get it right. And uh, we have violations that are non-escalated violations. Those are typically dispositioned at like a branch chief level, um, peer checks, et cetera. When we start talking about escalated issues that are severe level, you know, three or greater, uh, typically those involve uh, formal enforcement panels. We get headquarters involved. We make sure we have all the right subject matter experts involved. So it, it is a graded approach, but um, I think that's just a piece that I wanted to, to highlight. So thank you, Tony. I've mm -hmm. um, got a basic question about um, the requirement for when a, a plant has to complete decommissioning. If a multi-unit site like Indian Point, Dresden, Peach Bottom gets a 40-year extension for the operating units, would the 60-year limit for decommissioning for retired units be extended to align with the operating units? I look at that Bruce here. Bruce uh, gave me some, some insights. Um, so the, the simple answer is no. 
the 60-year the requirement uh, remains the same. Now, that said, you know, the NRC is not unwilling to entertain exemptions. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that the, the safety of the operating unit is maintained. So if the, the demantling, deconstruction activities of the, the retired unit wouldn't interfere in any way with the, the, the operating unit, we, we have and, and will entertain exemptions to that 60-year requirement. But it, it does hold as, as 60 years. Anything else on that, maybe? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add that, uh, you know, we've got these Dresden ones, Fermi ones, Peach one, um, you know, they're out there, and, and the expectation is, is that the way this has worked with this plants that are in, a, in safe store for 60 years is at year 50 you start doing the actual decon uh, to meet the 60-year requirement. But it's not always practical or even desirable to, to, to actively decommission a plant that's adjacent to an operating reactor. So there have been discussions around sure. exemptions, which may not be the most fruitful path to take. But um, I think there is a, a healthy discussion on options, which might include well, do what you can if you haven't already done what you could at the, uh, at the long retired plant that's adjacent to an operating reactor. And maybe what you do is wrap around your RCA to, the, to that unit and include it within the operating reactor's footprint, if you would, from a perspective of decommissioning and you defer the decommissioning of that unit along with the final decommissioning of the, of the operating units when the time comes. Great, thanks Bruce, appreciate that perspective. Amy, we received a, a question on uh, Three Mile Island, um, and you talked about historical preservation. By the way, the spot in action uh, was, was very interesting. Uh, also saw spot uh, cracking on within some pistachio nuts on a recent commercial. I don't know if you saw that. Really? They had the same robot. Uh, oh, wow. cool. Yeah. Um, but uh, the question had to do with the cooling towers at Three Mile Island. Um, you know, you talked about maintaining for a historical perspective the, the, the uh, control room. Um, obviously, the, the cooling towers are somewhat iconic. It's, it's very much associated with that unit. Um, do you know what the, the plan is for maybe the cooling towers or any other parts of Three Mile Island from a historical preservation perspective? Yeah, so we, you know, we have a LAR under NRC review to allow us to go to the next phase of decommissioning. Um, we also have a subsequent submission in front of the staff that deals with what's called Section 106. And Section 106 is the historical and cultural preservation, if you will. It's the required reviews that, that need to occur um, to kind of walk us through the historic and cultural process to help guide us and determine, you know, what things will be preserved, what things will not. So, you know, cooling towers in particular, that really, you know, we'll see where, where that leads us in terms of us going through the process. Great, thank you. Mr. Yamimoto, we received a question about um, retrieval of fuel debris at the Fukushima units. Can you, and I'll just read it. Um, we would just appreciate to hear your sharing of the view on the possible methods for the large scale fuel debris retrieval for the reactors at, at the Fukushima units. What kind of methods are you employing? In Uh, so thank you very much for your question. And let me see. Uh, we, we've been uh, st studied about uh, how, how to retrieve the fuel debris from uh, three reactors and. Uh, just now, we are uh, discussing about uh, fuel debris from uh, Unit 3, and uh, uh, su submarine uh, uh, method, uh, when I showed you on the right side, uh, one was uh, difficult to, uh, uh, to, to use, use it because uh, uh, sealing of the uh, PCB, is, uh, upper part of the uh, PCB is quite difficult, and so uh, I explained the uh, center of my OHP full uh, submersion system. It shows the uh, covers the, all the uh, reactors 
uh, with uh, strong uh, uh, structures and put uh, water into uh, the, uh, that into that uh, strong stru structures, uh, but and. Uh, we we have already studied uh, through the uh, we have already studied that the structure can be made with seismic resistance and with uh, space constraint of the one f. But still now there are many many uh, issues to uh, to overcome to achieve that. And so, uh, still now, we are uh, un under uh, discussion about how to achieve or how, uh, how to achieve the fuel debris from uh, these reactors. Okay. Great. Thank you, Anthony. I think the next question probably is is for you. Um, you talked about you know, the challenges of the fires at, at decommissioning plants. Um, is there any guidance on plants maintaining an on-site fire brigade or transition to relying on off-site agencies that uh, you know of or that is uh, readily available? And then maybe just talk a little bit more about your insights into, you know, best practice for hot work. Also interested in any other panel members' uh, thoughts on that. I'll kick it off. So uh, there, there is some guidance. Uh, most sites, when they decommission after a certain time, they transition to what's called an incipient fire brigade. Uh, they do have uh, goodwill contracts with off-site uh, agencies, uh, private fire companies, and things of that sort. Uh, and they maintain uh, liaisons with that and bring them on site to talk about uh, where they would go if there was a fire. Uh, but as, this, as the plants slowly decommission and buildings begin to disappear, uh, obviously, uh, well, starting with the, the the uh, site shutting down, the risks of fire uh, drop down dramatically. And after the Zerk fire window uh, is closed, then it goes down even further. So that's number one. Number two, after that happens, uh, they transition to what's called an incipient fire brigade. There is some guidance, uh, but generally it goes into an incipient fire brigade and uh, they have uh, procedures and things uh, on site to uh, learn how to, that for which they implement to fight fires. Um, did you want to add anything from the industry? Uh, yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> I'd just like to emphasize that uh, fire protection continues to be very important during decommissioning because if you really think about the risks, yes, the profile goes way down, but if you were to think about how you might be able to transport radioactive material to the public offsite, it's going to be, you know, through a fire is probably the, the, the way that would happen. So um, uh, I think as you get into decommissioning, fire prevention, fire protection is, is a very significant, important part of the, the licensees program to maintain and for NRC to oversee. Great. Thanks, Tony and Bruce. Appreciate that. Um, we received a question about uh, spent fuel management and how that factors into uh, the, the overall decommissioning plan. And, you know, my thought is that it, it is transferred to dry fuel storage before most decommissioning dismantling work. Any, any additional thoughts or perspectives on that, uh, Bruce or Tony? Or yeah, sure. Tony? I think that's one of the great success stories in the United States is the, uh, the ability for us to t pivot from ultimately you know, transporting this waste and this, this, this spent fuel to a permanent repository back you know, when we thought that would happen to being able to safely store this in dry storage. Uh, at the sites, you know, one of my old plants, Calvert Cliffs, you know, this, the fuel's never left the site. We've been operating since uh, since the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And that, that you know, the footprint for the dry storage, the ISFSI, in Independent Spent Fuel Storage Facility, is the size of a small Walmart parking lot. It's very impressive uh, when, you sh when you show folks that it's very safe. And it can be there for a long time, unfortunately, but it's safe for a very long time. So I think it's a success story, and, and the folks in that line of work continue to uh, innovate on how uh, we can more rapidly move from uh, a shutdown uh, and get this fuel into dry storage by accommodating the higher heat loads uh, associated with those in the designs of these casks. So I think it's a success story. Um, we're hopeful that you know there's gonna be someone who is able to license and operate a consolidated interim storage facility and ultimately uh, we find a way to permanently dispose of this fuel, and of course, as you've heard, I think over the past couple of days, the, the
the new reactor community is getting sort of interested in, in how this used fuel might be useful to them. Yeah, just to add, uh, the, uh, the introduction of the ISFACs, the independent spent fuel storage installations, when the, when the reactor shuts down and they, the first order of business is to remove the fuel and put it in the spent fuel pool, they've been uh, installing it into canisters, what they call canisters. The, the licensees, Holtec, TN, Arano, New Homes, they're very good at what they do. They've been doing this for a long time. Uh, they've been doing it since 1986. This is not new stuff. They do it, and they do it very slowly, and our inspectors are on site during uh, dry runs. Uh, they're there when they're actually loading uh, the first couple of canisters, and they do it, uh, you know, every uh, three years now uh, or, or, or every sooner, you know, uh, more frequently. But uh, our guys are there to observe this thing because the fuel could be out there for a number of years, depending on what happens finally with either interim storage or final uh, disposal. So, so our inspectors are there to observe the licensee's uh, performance for that. And then furthermore, one, it is, once it is on the pad, uh, there is security there and will be there until it finally goes to interim storage or final. And our inspectors ins inspect the security aspect as well. So I just wanted to mention that. Great. Thanks, Tony. Anyone else on the panel feel like they would like to weigh in? Okay. So we received a couple of questions that were very similar in nature, and I'll kind of summarize them both together. So it has to do with the level of public engagement through the, the decommissioning process, um, maybe for the NRC staff and then the, the industry staff. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, how we engage the, the local communities during the decommissioning process, what types of public events we hold, public meetings, and then Specifically for Bruce, we did, we did get a question about the, the NEI guidance that you referenced in your presentation. Does that account for a level of public interaction, account for the time it takes to do that uh, in your guide? So maybe start with Tony. Sure. Um, I just kick it off and then um, interested in your views on uh, uh, how we're doing and if we do more. Uh, so uh, for decommissioning, uh, we, uh, the staff, uh, hosts of what's called a PSDAR, uh, a public meeting for the post-shutdown decommissioning activities report. And we do that before, and actually Bruce Watson, who's here, has hosted that a number of times <laughs> throughout the, uh, for years. And so we do that. Uh, we've also had a number of webinars and uh, actual public meetings where we talk about uh, PSDAR's uh, shutdowns and, and uh, how decommissioning is done. We also hold, uh, government-to-government -government meetings to talk to uh, members of U.S. Congress, staffers, county executives, uh, mayors, things, uh, local, uh, uh, local elected officials, things like that. And so we continue to do that. And more recently, we've been having um, uh, similar public meetings to talk about uh, either pub, uh, security or emergency preparedness at site decommissioning sites and also for um, spent fuel. And we also are planning with uh, the program office, with Jeremy's staff, with Sean Anderson, we're planning further public meetings to talk about um, uh, effluent releases, which are allowed within our regulations. But Bruce? Yeah, I think um, you know, I'll start with NEI 2201, which is our guidance document. You know, we felt like we didn't really need to talk about public engagement in that document because folks have figured that out pretty well already. In fact, uh, you know, I'll give kudos to the NRC. They were directed by the Congress uh, to go around and collect information on how public engagement was done across the country. And I sort of trailed Bruce Watson around the country while he had held those public meetings. Uh, but uh, these community advisory boards or panels or whatever you call them um, have been quite successful. I'm not sure how they started, whether it was something that was instigated or suggested by the NRC or if they just began organically, um, but it, they're working very well. Um, and, you know, one, one of the NRC's conclusions when they went around the country looking at these boards and panels is that, you know, one size does not fit all. Um, these work best when they're developed by the locals working with the licensee uh, and other uh, stakeholders in the area. Um, there were a couple of places, I think, where there is no panel because the folks just weren't interested in following what was happening at the plant. Uh, so you know, uh, Bristol River comes to mind and there's a couple of others. But then there are places where these are very elaborate panels that are very active and engaged with what's happening at the plant. So I think uh, folks have figured that out and I think um, they're 
to, from everything I can tell, they work. They they are working very well for the for the licensee and the in the uh, uh, community. Great. And, and Amy, I think you mentioned that uh, you have a community engagement panel for Three Mile Island. Maybe a little bit of your experience yeah. and thoughts on that. Yeah. So I mentioned that we had a citizens advisory panel, also known as the CAP, at TMI two. It was set up to engage the community. It is a cross section of the community. We have. I would say decent participation. Our numbers have been going up. Um, but it is, like Bruce said, a result of what the community wants or needs. Um, so TMI2 had interest. Um, for example, Kiwani, at least not so far, there was no interest in a citizen's advisory panel there. So it just depends on the community and the wants and needs. The biggest issue is who buys the pizza for the meetings, I think. <laughs> So, Tony, in your last response, you talked about, you know, discharges, effluent discharges. Um, have, you, have you seen any growing trends in, you know, public perception of that, um, anxiety, even though the, you know, for the most part, they're all within NRC-established regulatory requirements? Yes, there's been recent, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a little anxiety about uh, you know, discharges. I believe that the stakeholders near, uh, for example, Pilgrim uh, and some of the, uh, you know, uh, a site in New York, um, I don't know if it's because the members of the public became aware that there are discharges where, where in fact, the discharges have been happening uh, in Pilgrim since 1972, continuously, except for, I think, 2019 and 2020, uh, 2021. But for 47 years, that, that they've been discharging regularly when the plant was operating. And in uh, Indian Point, for example, um, since Unit 1 was on operation in 1962 uh, until 74, and then since uh, Units 2 and 3 have been operating, there have been continuous discharges for years and continue to do so. I think there might be, it's possible that the stakeholders were not aware prior and that uh, now they become aware of what is it permitted for discharge. These discharges are actually, the water is not just dumped in some way. This, this water is actually processed, monitored, ensured that it meets the regulatory limits, and then the effluent discharges are, are, are done. So uh, there is some trends that people have some anxiety about it, but this is happening throughout the United States. And, uh, you know, it, it, there, there's a reason why we have our regulations that permit this sort of thing, and we deem it to, to be safe. Great. So we've got just a little over five minutes left. I think we've got time for probably one more question. And uh, we got a, an interesting one about maybe harvesting some knowledge from the decommissioning process, um, you know, doing uh, what I would call maybe failure analysis on components that, you know, come out of the decommissioning process to learn about failure mechanisms, uh, maybe feed that into operational experience for the operating fleet. Um, any thought from any of our panel members on, you know, learning from these components that have, you know, been in service for a long time, they've been subject to the effects of radiation, how do we take that knowledge and, and build upon it? Yeah, thank you. There's been quite a bit of interest in this, and I'm surprised that there hasn't been as much motion on it. Um, containment penetrations, piping and electrical penetrations uh, that have been serviced for a long time, those that are subgrade in particular, um, reactor vessel uh, components uh, and samples therefrom. I think, um, you know, EPRI's not on the panel today, but EPRI's been working with the NRC uh, and some of the licensees to figure out uh, what's the, what are the high value components to extract uh, and send over for some, for some R&D. I think that um, the important thing here is if the NRC or the research community has some interest in a component is to let the licensee know that early because it really has to be factored carefully into a very complex and aggressive dismantling uh, 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 project schedule and plan. So, um, I, you know, I think, you know, there's, there's, interest in flooding barriers, I recall, but I have not heard of anything happening along the lines of extracting samples or equipment to uh, take a look at those. But um, yeah, just as an engineer, I, I can appreciate the interest in, in uh, uh, doing some work on things that are coming out of these reactors to better inform 
the designs going forward and the regulatory framework around those things going forward in the future. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Mr. Yamamoto or Amy, any thoughts? Um, you've got a couple of really interesting sites that you know, have a history. Uh, so, thank you very much for the question. And uh, Fukushima Daiichi has a severe exper experience 12 years ago, and it's decommissioning. We, we need very, very long time. And so the uh, accumulation and transfer of the knowledge is quite important. And uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, uh, at least right, right now, uh, we, we are uh, just preparing for uh, retrieval, fuel debris retrieval, and uh, in near future, uh, we have to uh, make a, a good, good system about, uh, about uh, uh, tra transfer uh, of the knowledge to the next generation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, I think that's probably all we have time for today. Uh, Jeremy, uh, could I go, go back ahead. to that question that someone asked on the Inflation Reduction Act? Yeah, I think, please. Uh, just, just bottom line, I think you know, the, the immediate effect is gonna be it's gonna dry up the decommissioning market going forward because folks are gonna continue operating. But it wasn't just the Inflation Reduction Act, it was the Commercial Nuclear Credit Program and the DOE loans. And, and, and to a large extent, this, the, the actions were being taken at the state level to preserve uh, these operating power plants. But looking ahead, the Inflation Reduction Act is going to incentivize a lot of work that you're going to be familiar with. It's steam generator replacements as folks go into subsequent license renewal, reactor vessel head replacements, uh, steam dryers and whatnot, very large components that when you look at those projects, they're sort of decommissioning projects in the microcosm. And instead of building a, um, a place to store them on site when they're taken out of the reactor, we're going to want to transport those package and transport those for off-site disposal. And you know, there is a discussion happening right now um, between the industry and the NRC. And can we use, can we can we really treat those projects as decommissioning projects in in um, as many projects, if you will, and use the decommissioning trust fund for that purpose? And we think. We're going to make some headway on that this year. Uh, certainly, there's going to be a lot of work going forward uh, that's stimulated by the Inflation Reduction Act as we renew these plants and renew some of these components um, and uh, make sure that as we do those jobs, we can transport those large components off-site for disposal directly as opposed to storing them on-site. We've got hundreds of components that are being stored on-site around the country right now. That's probably not the greatest low-level waste storage place that we'd want to have. Great. Thank, thanks for that, Bruce. And, and I think it very much goes with the title of our presentation, our theme, or our, our panel, decommissioning in a dynamic environment. There's a lot of factors in play right now, and I think you hit upon a lot of them. So, Well, with that, um, I'm going to bring this, this uh, technical session to a close. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating today. I think it was a, a very robust discussion. I think a lot of unique perspectives were, were brought forward. I want to thank our panel members. Uh, who participated. Again, thanks to the liaison and session coordinator who, who brought this all together. I do want to thank our audience members who you know, provide questions and also who just came and listened and, and learned something. Um, I think it was fantastic. Um, I know that uh, a number of our panel members will likely be available after the session's over. If you, if you have a specific question, they'll, they'll likely be in the hallway. Um, you, can, you can grab them there. Um, just a couple last-minute closing things. Um, feedback is important to us. We're always trying to improve the RIC. Um, for those of you logged on and those um, who have accessed the, the portal, um, there is a feedback tab, and if you have any comments or suggestions on how we could make this session better or improve the RIC in general, uh, please don't hesitate to, to add those. I do have one last announcement I wanted to make, and um, the NRC is going to host a decommissioning lessons learned public workshop, uh, be a public meeting uh, sometime in the next few months. Um, I'd encourage everybody to, to look on our public website um, for the details on that. They'll be, they'll be noticed um, like any other public meeting and uh, look forward to a, a good attendance there. Um, with that, I want to thank everybody again and the session is closed. Thanks everyone.
need to be able to put our car somewhere. Yeah. Did you get Steve? Yes. Okay. Welcome, folks. Is that on? Okay. Thanks for coming to our session. My name is Terry Brock. I'm a senior health physicist in NRC's research office. Um, we're glad we were able to present the results of this study that's been going on for a while. Um, when uh, we asked, it started out with a interagency agreement between EPA, NASA, and, uh, and NRC with the DOE low-dose program at the time. And uh, one of the things NRC asked for, well, let's, let's do an epidemiology study of our radiation workers. Now, after the three years of COVID, I think we're all become epidemiologists.